For many people, Kole is one of those things that we are taught and dutifully practice as younger students. But we seem to find ourselves in the situation where two plus two doesn't really equal four. We might recognize that our fingers need flexibility. Maybe they seem rather stiff, or maybe we can't start the sound clearly enough and are taught Kole to get a sticky beginning. But all the work pulling and extending the fingers in the traditional Kole exercises doesn't really seem to do the trick. The fingers don't seem to find flexibility or perhaps they've become too floppy as a result. Perhaps we have to constantly think about keeping them flexible in certain passages, usually when we need shorter strokes. Those Kole exercises are hard work, pulling the fingers in and shooting them out again. As is so often the case with many of the traditions in our teaching heritage, we have a case of right idea, faulty means of getting there. How many of us ever have to think about whether our fingers are suitably flexible or not during the day? If you think about it for a minute, we hold and move so many different objects in so many complex ways, yet this question of flexibility never crosses our minds. It certainly would cross our minds if it felt bad and the fingers felt wrong, our brains would surely throw a red flag of warning at us, probably because it would feel as if we were going to drop the object or perhaps it just felt unstable in the hand. So like many aspects of playing, when we look directly into daily life, our bodies are clearly processing the necessary information with total ease. So much so that most of the time we don't notice anything at all. Imagine trying to cook a meal and being concerned about the flexibility of your fingers. It would be very difficult to cook. So imagine trying to play an etude or indeed a whole symphony worrying about them in this way. Equally important to consider is that it really cannot be the case that we need more finger muscles to move the bow. Many of the objects that we hold and move during an average day are way more cumbersome and awkward than our bows. Yet most school gym classes do not include Kole as part of a general health curriculum. And I don't know anyone who goes to the gym after work to practice Kole. But joking aside, we are alarmingly good at swallowing this type of technical stuff on our instruments because of the culturally inherited problems. There is a video on just this topic. It is really worth holding a mirror up to the illogical reasoning and corresponding activities that have become so deeply rooted in our traditional teaching. The actual meaning of the word kole is glued. This is not in dispute. The word is accurate. But what is in dispute is how we interpret it physically at the instrument and in our bodies. So let's look at an example. Supposing you take any reasonably sized object with some degree of weight to it, like a mug or a shampoo bottle, not an empty one, it'll be too lightweight to really feel what we're trying to look at. It might just be a glass. And you put it on a table, I'm gonna rest it on this book, at a comfortable height, using either hand, doesn't matter which, gently put your hand on it. And what you notice straight away is that you can already feel the collé element. The object is indeed glued to the table. Just try moving it a tiny amount and a little tiny wiggle, and you can feel that stickiness. I often refer to that stickiness as the Velcro moment. The combination of gravity and friction caused by the interaction of the object, which has weight, your arm, which has weight, and the solid surface that the object is resting on will produce glue and exactly the right amount of glue according to all the elements involved. It's very important to say with this in mind that the arm touching the object feels an easy touching and resting. It is not collapsed or holding up. The arm is simply resting down, comfortable, buoyant and present to the object. This is the same when we stand on the floor, we're buoyant and present to the floor. We don't sag or yank ourselves upwards. If you try lifting the arm a little bit or feeling floaty with the arm, the glue starts to become unstuck. 
Equally, if you sag and collapse into the object, the glue becomes heavy. It really feels overglued. Let's take another example. Supposing you're trying to do the same thing, but with a piece of paper instead of the cup. What happens to the colnaeness, the stickiness factor or the glue? It's going to be seriously diminished because the paper creates so little friction. There is, of course, some glue there, but it is proportionate to the ingredients involved and therefore very small, mini glue or mini Velcro. So if we're holding a bow that has length and weight to it, and we let that rest on a string that has a high degree of tension in it, we'll get glue. The three ingredients of bow, arm, and string will produce that without anything extra from us. The glue part of collet is built in. So let's move on to the finger action by going back to the object on the surface. If I'm holding the object comfortably and I gently wiggle it back and forth in tiny amounts, what happens to my fingers? They move in response, not a lot, but they definitely respond to the motion from the forearm. This is the other component of collet, the flexibility in the fingers. Let's be 100% clear about what exactly is happening here. The forearm, the chunky part, is moving the object. If you touch that chunky part of your forearm, you can actually feel this spot. The movement is tiny, therefore the smaller fulcrums are more visible. This is hugely important and has become the cause of so much misunderstanding. So let's look at this a little bit further. If I slide the object over a larger distance, the larger fulcrums in my arm are more visibly responsive. If I make the motion smaller, the smaller fulcrums of the fingers and wrists and knuckles become more visible as the ripple effect diminishes in accordance to the size of the movement. This sounds complicated, but it's very clear and simple. If I wave from a long distance and make a large movement, what you see is the larger fulcrums of the shoulder and elbow responding to that larger motion initiated by the forearm. If I wave in a secretive way close to my body, the size of the movement is much smaller. Therefore, the smaller fulcrums become more visible. It's essential to say that regardless of the size of the movement, the initiation will always be in the forearm. But the way that motion ripples through the fulcrums corresponds to the size of the movement. So if I wiggle this cup on the book, the smaller fulcrums of the fingers, knuckles and wrist will be much more obvious in their response. But they can never become the initiators. In 24-hour practice, we're always taking the logic of our daily activities onto the instrument. But let's reverse this. Let's take the illogical movement of the fingers that we learn in traditional collet and try that on the cup or whatever object you're working with. What happens if I flick the fingers forward and then shoot them back again with these traditional motions? It's nothing short of ridiculous. If you try this with a bunch of kids, they all just giggle. It makes them instinctively feel silly. But if you just gently wiggle the object, the fingers and wrists know exactly what to do in response. There are a couple more aspects to look at. The first is that in order for this logical response to work, the fingers and hand have to be holding the bow the same way as the object. This means an equal five finger team holding easily with the support of the forearm. There is a video on this. If the index finger is stretched away even a tiny bit and or the little finger is pushing down as a counterbalancing mechanism, then the hand and fingers cannot possibly respond to the motion of the arm as the hand is being pulled apart, which creates tension that will radiate right up the arm. This brings us to a bit of a chicken and egg situation. The second factor is in the same family as the discussion on culturally inherited problems, which includes the dangers of our bigger, better, faster, more culture. Looking into the Collet mystery contributes to this discussion. It would seem that the poignancy of the music, its emotional content, the challenges of playing and performing, etc., 
have perhaps led us astray in many aspects of our teaching tradition. The music itself is indeed enormous in its human capacity, but that doesn't mean that the weight of its human message has to be equalized by the creation of unnecessarily complex movements at the instrument and force us to use alien movements. Alien movements that are hard to learn don't somehow result in being equal to the complexity of the music. Surely the opposite would seem far more logical. If we are to really communicate the complexity and the profound nature of the music, then we need to be so simplified in our physical relationship to the instrument that our brains and bodies actually have enough space that we are really free to communicate the music. We couldn't survive one mealtime moving the knife and fork with these traditional collet motions. So why would we be able to put our hearts and souls into the music by employing them? The glue is happily built in for us, as is the responsiveness in the fingers. If we're having problems with either, then we need to check first if there is any holding up or collapsing in the bow arm that will disturb that glue. The bow arm has to recognize its fundamental down or easy resting on the string. And then perhaps we'll have to check that the five finger holding mechanism is really working with the support of the forearm so that the fingers can actually respond. If all is well with both of these, then the rest is built in. So let's look at all of this on the violin. G major. Or the next phrase. Or Bach E major, which has off the string elements. 